basis for our sermon this morning is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus had just called Peter, Andrew, James, and John to be his disciples. He told them that he would make them fishers of men as they would follow him. And so the first Sabbath that we come to, he does the thing that is perfectly important for them and necessary to make them even better fishers of men. They spend time in the synagogue, gathered at the feet of God's word. And just as it was the custom of the day to invite many different rabbis to come and speak on a Saturday morning, for the Jewish people, Jesus, that rabbi that had become known here and there, was asked to speak and give a message about God's word. And as Jesus preached on that Saturday in the synagogue, everybody's eyes and ears were fastened on him. Their attention was fixed on him. It was riveted and could not be taken off because as Jesus preached about the word of God and the coming kingdom, that message of repent and believe the good news that I have come to save you from your sins and give you everlasting life, it was unlike any of the ways that the rabbis they had heard preached. Oftentimes, when the rabbis would get up in their day and age, they would give long spiels about all the different opinions of a hundred different rabbis. This rabbi says this, and this rabbi says this, and this rabbi says this, and this rabbi says this. And so now you just kind of figure it out on your own. Figure out what God's word means for you. Still other rabbis got super nitpicky and started to focus on all the little minor details of what they believed the law meant in their own lives. If you weren't to work on the Sabbath day, what would that mean? It meant that you couldn't go out in your neighbor's field for a walk and and pick grains of head from the field. No, that would be considered work. That would be considered harvesting. And so on either side, whether they emphasized the law incredibly, or they just left God's word open to any interpretation of whatever whim in the human heart came up in the congregation that day, Jesus came and he preached with authority. This is God's word, and this is what it means for your life. You are sinners who are damned, and you need somebody to save you from your sins. You cannot save yourself, and only I can. And if you believe in me, you will have heaven. If you do not, you will have hell. He didn't say exactly those specific words that I did, but that was the content of Jesus preaching. He pulled no punches. He didn't sidestep difficult issues. He preached the word of God with all tenacity and all fire so that the people listening would be cut to the heart, but also so that they would be lifted up and comforted with the good news that he was the suffering servant promised in Isaiah the prophet. The one who would be stricken and smitten by men and afflicted. The one who would know suffering. The one through whom his wounds would bring healing to the world. Yes, in this Jesus that stood before him, before them, they had life. And they would have life to the full if they just trust what he was saying. And at that point, as Jesus got done preaching the true word of God in all zeal and in all power... The devil himself had decided to set up a chapel there, right there in the sanctuary of that synagogue. And because the devil fears the word of God, because he cannot stand when God's will is accomplished and people hear about the good news of Jesus, he chimed in. And he chimed in through the voice of somebody that was sitting in the back of the synagogue that day. This is what the Gospel of Mark tells us. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. That was a real demon. Demons actually exist. Demons can actually possess bodies and force them to say and do things that the individual would never ordinarily do on their own. 
This isn't what modern man wants to say, is just a way of speaking about mental illness. No, this person was really forcibly moved to say this by another spirit that had set residence up in their body. And we shouldn't also think that it doesn't happen today either. This was back in Jesus' day. No, it happens all around the world and it happens even in America to this day. People that open themselves up to demonic influences can find themselves at times possessed by the devil. If any of you have been in other cultures where maybe spirits are believed in, you might yourself have also witnessed this. Jesus is driving out a very real supernatural being that had taken up residence in a very real human being. And if we do not believe that, we lose out on all the comfort that this text has to provide for us. And when this spirit speaks, what was its intent? Well, who is the devil? And who are all his fathers, followers? The devil is the father of all lies. And all of the demons that followed after him are liars as well. So why in this section does a demon speak the absolute truth? Because sometimes truth can be used for dishonest and deceitful purposes. Sometimes the truth can be used for wicked ends. Even just think about gossip, if you will. When somebody gossips, oftentimes they don't tell something that's false. Oftentimes they say something that's true, and they say something that's true in order to destroy, in order to bring down, in order to do evil. And so just stop and think about this. If the devil is the father of lies, and he most certainly is, What would it do to Jesus' credibility and message if the devil would be allowed to keep on speaking and keep on spewing forth that Jesus is the Son of God? It would mean that Jesus, if he would let that demon keep speaking, would be in league with the devil himself. It would mean that he wouldn't be the Savior. But also think of it this way. Imagine there's somebody in your life that is known to be a very deceptive and dishonest person. Everybody knows that it's hard for them to tell the truth. And now they go around to a lot of the people that you know and they say about you, you know, they're a really honest person. If a liar is testifying that you're a really honest person, what will many people start to think about you? You're not actually an honest person. You must be in league with them. You must be a deceptive person as well. So while the devil was very terrified of Jesus, that he would destroy them, and for good reason, because they are only wicked and deserve to be destroyed, they were also trying to knock down the message that Jesus had just proclaimed to these people. They either wanted the people to be terrified of Jesus and the power and authority that he had over the devil, Or they wanted them to start thinking that he would use his power and authority not to save them as he had first proclaimed, but rather maybe Jesus would turn on them too for their wickedness and destroy them. The devil's intent is always to attack Jesus and always to attack the gospel. And so if he can even use truths to that end, he will do so. And what did Jesus do to demonstrate his power and authority? With one word, he told that spirit to be quiet. The Greek there says, be muzzled. Another way that we could translate it would be, shut up. The devil doesn't ever deserve to have his voice heard. He always needs to be silenced. Evil and wickedness has no place falling on the ears and the hearts and minds of people that God made to bring him glory into the world and follow his path. And then he drives the demon out, and out it goes. When Jesus speaks, the devil has to listen. But oftentimes, the devil doesn't show himself. In fact, throughout most of the pages of Scripture, we don't see the devil show himself face to face to many human beings. In fact, he's always just quietly in the background, because he knows that's how he can best do his work. In the Old Testament, we only have a few times when we hear of the devil. We hear of him in the Garden of Eden. We also hear about him in the story of Job, though Job himself would have never seen him. We hear about him coming before God and asking if he can plague Job. And then in another one of the books of Chronicles, we also hear about him. We hear about him in one of the prophets as well, about a prince who was brought low by God, a prince who was puffed up with his own pride. But that's about it. And yet, throughout all of the pages of the Old Testament, we see the wicked devil's work 
in the lives of people, both Jew and Gentile alike. Because if the devil showed himself, the, the jig would be up. You would already know that you need to fight against him. He's wicked. Of course he needs to be resisted. But if he can get you to just end up being content with what you see in the world and to stop thinking about spiritual forces fighting for your soul and for the souls of everyone around you, now he's already won half the battle. He's already got you to be comfortable. A wise person once said that the greatest lie that the devil has sold the Western world and the modern world of our day that so often focuses only on the material, the greatest lie the devil has sold the world is that he doesn't exist. <coughs> if people deny that God exists, then they'll deny the devil exists. But even for many that don't deny God's existence, they also at the same time say, yeah, God exists, but the devil doesn't. People have this idea that the devil is kind of like a cartoon character. He might have a pitchfork and some little red horns. People even dress up like him on Halloween as if it's a cute thing to do. But make no mistake, the devil's mouth is yawning and open and wide for you. He is a devil. He is a lion that prowls around looking for someone to devour. He wants to sink his teeth into you. He wants to suffocate your soul. He wants to break the neck of your faith and drag you to hell. When we think that the devil isn't real, we only have to contemplate the effects of sin in our lives in the world today. If you've ever looked in the eyes of somebody that told you they knew what they were doing was wrong, but they were going to do it anyway, you looked in the face of the devil. Oh no, they themselves are not the devil, but in behind that visage that they have, behind their face, in their mind, in their soul, the devil resides. And if you've ever heard somebody say, yeah, I did that, but it's not such a big deal, you've uttered the words of the devil, or you yourself have heard the words of the devil. See, if the devil doesn't exist, sin becomes really trivial. Sin becomes something that's not very dangerous, and we don't need to be concerned about it. Just live and let live. Let everybody do what they're going to do, because in the end, it'll all be okay. You do your life, I'll do mine. And that's that. Can't we just all get along? Can't we just live in peace? What's all of this conspiratorial talk about demons that exist in the world and are waging war for the souls of people in the world today? And so we take down our guard. We might stop taking up the word of God in our homes. We stop teaching our children those stories about very real people that lived from the time of Adam and Eve onward. Our children don't know the stories of those that are great in the faith, and so their faith isn't built up. They know the littlest that they can possible about Jesus Christ, their Savior. We don't need to have them in church consistently and regularly because they'll be okay. They were baptized. It'll all be good. They're in the kingdom of God, except baptism isn't magical. Baptism doesn't work where you get it once, and now you're good for the rest of your days. It's like a meal that you've been fed. A meal that fills you up and satisfies the soul, but you never stop feeding your children. And on and on throughout our years, we become more and more convinced that this is really not a big issue. To keep ourselves rooted in the word of God, to quiet the mouth of the devil, to tell him to be quiet and get out of our lives. And so he just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's a festering wound that if left unchecked, will lead to spiritual destruction. Make no mistake. The devil is out for you. The devil is out for me. The devil is out for your children. The devil is out for the entire world. And he will never slumber. He will never sleep. He is always prowling for you. I saw a video this last week. It was like a, a six foot, six foot two, young strapping guy. He seemed to be pretty ripped. He put on his boxing gloves and he was ready to box with somebody that was an old, uh, an old boxer, an old teacher who hadn't stepped in the ring in years. It could have been his coach, I don't really know, but his elderly coach was maybe 65, 70 years old, looked like. He looked like he was a foot shorter than this young boxer. And when the boxer, the young guy, put up his mitts, he was just kind of like, okay, whatever, what's this guy going to show me? And immediately, the 70-year-old boxer sprang into action, landed blow after blow after blow, and knocked that young man on the ground because he thought he knew better. 
The devil is experienced. The devil knows your weaknesses. He's pried and, and poked you and found all the different chinks in your armor. He's tested you and tried you over and over and over. And he's kept track. He's kept score of the things that you're bad at and the things that you're good at. And where is he going to attack you? He's going to attack you in your soft spot. He's going to go for the landing kill, finally, after he's landed blow after blow after blow. It sounds like a hopeless, scary battle. It ain't hopeless, but it can be scary. We need to understand that we need Jesus in our life to tell the devil to be quiet. We need Jesus because he alone can bring us victory over Satan. And he alone can set us free from the slavery to sin. He alone can speak against those temptations and send the devil packing. What are we told in the Bible? We're told, resist the devil. Stand firm against him and he will flee from you. In the book of Ephesians, we're told that as we put on the the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the gospel sandals of peace, as we take up the sword of the Spirit, we will be able to stand against all of the devil's assaults until in the end, on the last day, when God judges the world, he will count us righteous. And we will only be standing on that day if we are found in Jesus Christ, our Savior. The one who never let the devil speak the one who never toyed with sin, the one who never gave ear to the temptations of the devil and said, you know what, maybe I'll just listen for a little bit. Every single day he shut the devil down and said, be quiet, shut up. I am not going to listen to you and your lies for they are straight from hell and they will only be harmful. And every single day he did that for you. And he drove this demon out to prove to you that he has done the same in your life. One of the things that used to be connected to the baptismal rite, when we put the water and the word on the child or the adult or the the adolescent as they're brought into the kingdom of God, there was a part of that rite that was called in the church for many hundreds of years the exorcism. And do you know why it was called the exorcism? Because when we're born into this world, we're born into the kingdom of Satan. And when we are baptized, the devil is driven out Our sinful nature is drowned. And Jesus Christ, the conquering king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, comes and sets up residence in our heart to deliver us from our sins. And only if he comes into our heart are we then set free from all condemnation, from all guilt, from all shame. And the devil must flee. That is the truth. You are baptized children of God. Christ lives in you. And he will not willingly give up that reign in your heart. But what he shows us in our passage for today is also that when we hear the temptations of the devil, we must tell him to be quiet. And not only that, we must tell him to be gone. Maybe you've been um, at a job. Maybe some of you are even managers. And you had a worker that was divisive. They complained about everything. They complained about their fellow workers, but they did so often behind their back. And you addressed it with them, and you told them, this needs to stop. It's not going to be good for our business. You're actually causing a lot of disruptions. And they said, okay, I'll stop. And they didn't. And they kept going. Would it be a good thing for you as a business leader to let them stay in your company and stay on part of that team? You know the answer. It's absolutely not. A divisive person needs to be removed. When Jesus heard the devil speak out of this man, he could not let the demon remain in him, for Jesus loved this human being that was possessed by the devil. He loved him. And there was only one thing that he could then do, or he wanted to do. Get rid of that divisive spirit. Send it far away from the man, and set him free as well. And that's exactly what Jesus did. By the power of his word, that was it. That's it. It wasn't some massive show. It was just a few words spoken. And those words are the eternal power of God that he connected to them so that the Spirit drove that demon straight from his heart. If you're wondering to yourself, how can I fight the devil? It's not on your own. Maybe you've tried on your own. 
You've tried with a lot of different self-help books. You've tried to just structure your life in the right way. You've told yourself when you did something wrong, you just do better tomorrow. You thought, if I just buckle down, I'll make sure I get it done. You can't fight the devil on your own. You need his word. Not just weekly, not just monthly, not just once a year. You need his word every single day of your life. And that applies to me too. And when we have that word in our lives on a daily basis... The comfort that we have is to know that the devil can't dwell where the word of God is. You will not be possessed by a demon like that man was because the Lord possesses your heart. And when he possesses your heart, is he going to let it go? In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, God says through his prophet, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, they will not sweep over you. When you pass through the fire, it will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Today see that Jesus speaks with authority through his word. When Jesus speaks, the devil listens. But also understand that when Jesus speaks, we want to listen. Because only by listening to him will we maintain our status in the kingdom of God. Only by listening to him regularly and daily and weekly and monthly and yearly will we stay as children of God until the end as we fight against the devil and God comes and he issues his judgment on the world but for you and me, we will stand firm because Jesus is our protection. Jesus is our strength. Jesus is our defender. So tell the devil to be gone and he will flee from you because Jesus is on your side and mine. Amen.